Hey, good afternoon, Modexus, and uh, welcome to another edition of Your Best Life. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about sphingolipids. So if you know all about sphingolipids, you can just bypass this video. If you've never heard of sphingolipids, you might want to listen in. Uh, they are something that I think is going to get a lot of a lot more attention in the future because we now know what they do. Uh, sphingolipids were first discovered in 1820 and uh, it's a fat molecule in our brain. Nobody really knew what it did and the reason it got the name sphingolipid was of the sphinx because they're very mysterious. Their activity was very mysterious. Their ability to change shape was, you know, they could just suddenly change shape and do something else and so they were, they were an enigma and um, nobody could really put their finger on it. But recently, uh, research on sphingolipids, due to genetics, so there's a, a class of genetic diseases called sphingolipidosis, or sphingolipidoses, and, and that's a class of genetic disease, Fabry disease being one of those. And uh, so I was learning in my genetics about these different diseases, and I came across uh, the sphingolipids, and... Uh, their activity. So what do sphingolipids actually do for us in our brain? Well, the mysterious part about them is, is they're a signaling molecule between all of our brain hormones. So while we knew that there's some way, I mean, usually, you know, we're balancing serotonin and dopamine or epinephrine and norepinephrine and adrenaline, and they're, and they're kind of compartmentalized, but yet we knew there was some something going on and some ability to communicate. We thought it was genetic. Well, it turns out it's sphingolipids that are the signaling molecules and they somehow measure levels of hormones and trigger this and trigger that and they can communicate. So uh, that's a really important thing. They also can, re they're reparative. They can repair myelin sheath and that was never known before. So myelin sheath is what covers your nerves and we lose myelin sheath in Parkinson's, in Alzheimer's, in some forms of dementia, uh, multiple uh, sclerosis, uh, muscular dystrophy, other places where our nerves are losing their myelin sheath and so they don't work as good and we lose body functions or we lo lose cognition. So if we could increase myelin sheath, we could prevent, perhaps prevent a lot of these you know, very debilitating sort of conditions. Cognition in particular, uh, memory, um, just uh, the, the, uh, migraines is another thing, but all, all these things to do with our brain and, and some behavioral issues as well. And so what I was reading about and what struck me was the way that we can increase the activity of sphingolipids, one is through exercise, so just short brief periods of vigorous exercise will stimulate sphingolipid activity. Um, it's really intense, so a lot of people would not do that, especially if they're elderly. Uh, they're not gonna go out and sprint, for instance. Uh, they're, that's just not something they're gonna do. Uh, sunshine will, will help as well. And um, that's great if you live in a country or part of the country where we get sunshine all year round, but I live in a part of the country where you know we get sunshine very briefly, like six months, maybe seven months of the year, or five to six months of the year, we won't see the sun due to the rain. We live in a rainforest and it makes it very beautiful. And when the sun comes out, it's tremendous. But uh, so that's a couple of ways we can do it. Uh, reducing stress is another way. And I mean, that's a challenge. We don't even have any parameters for stress reduction at all. So uh, I don't even know hardly what that means. Tranquility would help that. but. If we reduce reactive oxygen species in the brain, we automatically get an increase in sphingolipid activity. And what reduces reactive oxygen species? Well, glutathione is the master at reducing reactive oxygen species. So the article I was reading was praising glutathione, not for its direct activity on sphingolipids, but for its ability to reduce reactive oxygen species and then they saw this corresponding increase in sphingolipid activity and explains why when you take glutathione over long periods of time 
you can get changes in behavior, memory, cognition. You can get all these things, even people with diseases of the nerves, if they optimize their glutathione over periods of time, they'll get, uh, they'll see beneficial effects at that. And this, this explained it all to me. So I was very excited to learn that. And I'm very excited to share that with you. So uh, glutathione, also adaptogens will help and Lyft is full of adaptogens. And then our new product, ProBioBalance has ashwagandha in it, which is a great adaptogen. But not only is it a great adaptogen, it's also tremendous at reducing reactive oxygen species in our cardiovascular system and also helping preserve nitric oxide activity. And nitric oxide activity, both in our brain and in our body, is very important for the absorption and utilization of proteins. It helps proteins stay in our blood longer so then they can be used and uh, relaxes the cardiovascular system. There are a lot of benefits to nitric oxide. So modulating nitric oxide and modulating reactive oxygen species through glutathione, probial balance, lift, uh, and maybe tranquility um, going to have even better effects than we thought before. So anyway, it's Thursday. I hope you enjoyed this. It's the end of the month. Um, I hope you've reached your goals and everything's good. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great weekend.